All right, y'all thought that I might be fibbing. This is proof right now. The Letterman Podcast. We have one sponsor, one sponsor only, but it is Rupert G and the Hello Deli. Thank you very much for sponsoring our show, Rupert. It's my honor, Mike. La 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 la. Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. Okay, so we are in this time where uh, guests are starting to return back. We have uh, we've done our heavy lifting the first year and uh, three quarters or so, and now uh, you know the guests that we have said please come back, and and many of them that we have leverage over uh, have 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 agreed uh, to come back. Here's we've got one today who's an enthusiastic one, and in fact it's a sequel, uh, literally a sequel to the episode that was set up uh, in, 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 the, in his first appearance. Jeremy Weiner, writer with Late Show with David Letterman for years and years, um, you know, saw it right to the end, started early on, uh, started with for Conan and, um, you know, became a, uh, an intern and then a research. By the way, uh, not to bury any leads here, the lead of this show is the show and tell episode, okay? So so when Jeremy came on the first time, he said he's got a box up in his attic. He hasn't looked at it in years. That's his Letterman on it. And we're going to open that box together on an episode. This is that episode. But, and it is every bit as lovely as you would think it would be for me. Those who have any idea about the way that I tick, you know that I'm a bit of a collector. Uh, I love I love this stuff. I love the artifacts from the show. And uh, uh, this episode does not disappoint. There are so many very cool, little teeny tiny uh, detailed uh, things that are in this box that really do a good job of showing how uh, the late show with David Letterman worked and the camaraderie and the processes of some of these things. However, superseded by what might be one of the greatest stories ever told on this show back from when Jeremy was an intern. And that's all I'm really going to say. If you looked at the thumbnail of this episode, if you're watching on the YouTube, you've seen the thumbnail of it. It has to do with that. If you're listening uh, on the Apple and, and or, or, or one of the audio formats, this might be one you want to watch on Spotify video or any of the video uh, platforms that we have for the Letterman podcast because it's a show and tell episode. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to hear, we describe everything. Uh, so hopefully the audio uh, experience is fine as well, but you really want to see some of these things and the story that he tells about what he did when he was an intern for one week. Uh, I cannot, I cannot express the delight I have for this story enough. Jeremy's just a great guy. He and I are similar age. Uh, we've got similar interests in many ways. And uh, that is that is extremely evident as we start the conversation. It was just like a couple of buddies uh, catching up on some things a little bit and 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 telling some old stories, uh, some old work stories. There's a po there's a point in there where he pulls out a, a Comic Con lanyard because uh, he went to Comic Con. It was back in 2001. And one of the things he says is, "Oh boy, that was just that was so long ago." Like. 23 years ago and, and it's it's amazing for those of us who loved late show in its heyday and we can think back to some of these segments that he talks about he talks about going to biff with certain events or whatever that comic-con for example and 20 plus years ago and this is why we do the show we do the show to preserve these memories and to give folks who love looking into the past which this new generation coming up seems to love to do I get talked to by a whole bunch of people that are in my life, young stand-ups that are in my life uh, who are in their in their 20s asking me about the 90s, asking me about the two like it's so cool watching the throwback culture happen and being able to be a teeny tiny part of it with this show and what we're bu all building here as a community, what we're building here together. It's such a special thing and I don't know that we have an episode in recent memory that has encapsulated the spirit of that as much as we do in this one because jeremy opening up this box and showing all of these amazing things uh it, it really in my opinion it's a time capsule in way more ways than one it is a literal time capsule of course it's also a bit of a philosophical one and a cultural one and i just uh, i really appreciate him for 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 doing this little experiment it it worked out beautifully um he, he was, uh, you know, so gracious and saying, hey, if there's anything that isn't right here, feel free to cut anything out or whatever. No, I'm putting everything in. This is this was incredible. Uh, just a great experience from a great guy and uh, appreciate him very, very much. He's got some projects that are hopefully going to get greenlit or, or, or be, uh, you know, and we want to be part of that uh, machine to celebrate 
the Letterman alumni that are doing so many cool things out there in entertainment today. Uh, more elements of that coming soon with future guests as well. Um, some from directions that you might not expect. Oh, what does that mean, Mike? I don't even know what that means. Well, I kind of do. Um, but let's go right to the show here. You're not here to see me. Uh, you're here to put up with me and uh, really enjoy, and you will enjoy um, the, going through this amazing time capsule with Jeremy Weiner. Jeremy, the thing that I love about being uh, midstream, almost to the end of year two of the Letterman podcast, is we are now um, uh, reaping what we have sowed. We have sowed relationships uh, with folks uh, early on in this thing, and now we're starting to reap those relationships where we can just kind of get going. Uh, everybody, go back and watch Jeremy's first episode if you want to talk. If you want to see how uh, he started in this thing, uh, this ride, this Mr. Toad's Wild Ride that was late show with David Letterman, started with Conan, um, and 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 ended up with Kevin Smith. The last time we talked, you were you were judging uh, Kevin Smith's film right. festival, whatnot. You're still in Highland. Just the second one. You did okay. I was gonna ask if you were part of yeah. if you were part of the second one. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I okay. I don't know. Are you a fan of the uh, of, of the rap music that the kids like these days? Do you yeah. Like rap music? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So there was a gentleman last week who dropped a who dropped an album, and his name was Kanye West. He dropped an album, and sure. there is a song. I think it's the fourth song on the album, and it has a significant clip of of from Dogma in it. Jay, really? Jay, yeah, yeah. There's like a, a Jason Muse, massive, massive uh, line. Like the whole song is centered around a line from Dogma. And uh, oh, really? by the way, I'm not going to say what line it is because if you know Kevin Smith movies, they're they're kind of filthy. And and the mm -hmm. line is, but Kanye West wrote an entire song centered around a Kevin Smith. <laughs> That's really Kevin funny. Smith I haven't heard it because Kanye and I are kind of, um, you know, are we, you on the outs? Yeah, it's um, it's a little bit of a, a thing. <laughs> yeah. He's sort of, I'm keeping him at arm's length currently, given his <laughs> circumstances. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. How was the, uh, how was year two of the film festival? Was it It's, good it's always a lot of fun. It's yeah. always a little daunting at first when you get a link with 350 films to review. But yeah. once they start getting narrowed down, there's some real, you know, gems in there. And it's really fun to sort of see. Uh, you know, what comes through and, you know, what ends up getting awards at the end. So it's always fun. It's just great. It's a great way for, you know, Kevin's so great with his theater supporting the local community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just fun to sort of be a part of that vibe. If uh, I, 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 Kevin Smith, I've, I've said this in the past. I think I might even said it to you actually in our first episode. One of his, the influences of, of, if I have a podcasting influence, he is certainly, certainly near the top of the list. Um, yeah. And I, and I still pay attention to the stuff that he's putting out there. He talks about the movie theater a lot. He talks about the economics of being in the, in the, the movie theater business and, you know, lamenting, you know, the days when we, you know, guys like us were growing up and what movies were uh, in the, in the theater then versus what they yeah. are now and all of that stuff. He is sure created some inventive uh, ways of getting butts and seats in that place. Um, yeah. You know, showing the, 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 the Joel Schumacher uh, Batman forever extended cut and, and yeah. some of the different things that he has done to he had uh, the Russo brothers there recently to do a Q and a, which was great. Yeah, uh, they're doing, they're doing like a, a short film challenge now where you can submit um, entries for like a short film. Then you have to use a line of dialogue and a certain prop, I think. And then they're going to pick a winner that's going to run before the uh, screenings there, which is really cool. So it's just a, a neat way for him to sort of really show his support for where he grew up, you know. Yeah. And they're cultivating creativity. I love that. That's one thing about Kev that I've always loved. The message that he's always put out there is if you feel like you want to make something, go make something. And, and um, yeah. I just, I love that he has led by example and has encouraged people at the same time. Um, how are things going for you? What are you working? I know you got kids in college and all that kind of stuff. Things going are good. On. Yeah. It's and, super busy. Yeah. I have a junior in high school and a daughter in college. So it's really busy and uh, just turned in a draft of a script that I'm excited about. So I'm, I'm curious to see sort of what develops with that. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we can break some news on here at some point down the road and talk oh, about it. Oh, so. you know, I want to do that. I, yeah. I love doing that. Um, yeah. You know, we got Steve Young coming up. He's he's got some things that uh, he's breaking. Um, there are other people within the Letterman uh, alumni. I love the idea of helping being part of a promotional machine or or, or yeah, breaking sure. news and things like that. So, yes, thank yeah. you for saying that. I appreciate it. But now uh, let's not bury the lead. Uh, we said in the first episode why you were coming back. And I think in all the promotional, yeah. if, if people have clicked on this, they know it's show and tell day. And I love show and tell day. I love 
I'm yeah. a collector. I love these things. In the last episode that you were on, you talked about how you had a box up in the attic that you haven't opened uh, in a long time. You know, it's full of Letterman stuff. And um, and one time yeah. you can come on here and we can open this box together. Now, full disclosure, have you opened this box yet? No, I haven't opened it um, since before we moved here. Yeah, no, we moved about uh, uh, four or five years ago. And before that, I think I had a couple of boxes. And I'm, I'm sure I've narrowed it down at some point. But this box, I think, is the essence of uh, what I've saved just to look back at at some point and take a trip down memory lane. But, Why not do it here? So exciting. Um, and it's great because we, uh, I, for those who are members of the Facebook group or whatever that you saw that we just teased one image and it was a white box that said Letterman on it. And that was it. Yep. And you've got it right there. Yep. Uh, we, we know, we think, we think we know, I should say one of the items in there is a pencil that's gone to space. Uh, that's one item that we think we know is there, but other than that, unsure at this point, and it's a potpourri and uh jeremy let's let's let's, let's do, do some it. show and tell let's do it let's do it let's see <laughs> and we'll breeze through if, if this gets boring just move me along if this is if there's something that piques your interest you want to talk more about it let's do it you're a sweetheart i think you'll find right, that um, none of this stuff bores me uh all right it, it looks like we're going to start with books excellent all right what do we got oh we there's got, um, book. letterman the last giant of late night by jason zinneman just had a conversation with him this week. He's fantastic. Oh, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's such he's a great guy. Uh, Late Shift, Bill Carter. Just had Bill Carter on for the second time here. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Chris Elliott, The Guy Under the Sheets. Okay. If anybody hasn't read that book, that is a fantastic book. Really good. People need to. Yes, absolutely. And we give Chris Elliott love every time. And we give send love to Chris Elliott. And uh, who knows? One day, maybe genius. you never He's know. He's so great. He's so yeah. great. Uh, Last day's Letterman, Scott Ryan, one of the best yeah. Letterman books ever written. Uh, for our conversation about Steve Young, everything's coming up profits. Right there. Uh, Age of Industrial Musical, Steve Young and Sport Murphy. Absolutely, lots of Steve right, Young else? love coming up. George W. Bush: An Unauthorized Oral History by Tom Ruprecht. Have you read this? No, I keep to, I keep meaning to, and people keep telling me about. It. I've read excerpts of it. I have read excerpts of that book. Yes, that is one that is just a, one of those little gems that a lot of people didn't even real. It flew under the radar. A lot yeah. of people don't realize that that it's book really exists. Um, and it's great Tommy, too because Tommy uses gave the quotes, so he'd be like, you know, check out page forty-seven, and you could see, you know, your name. Uh, it's super funny though. It's great. Let's go back to Tommy for a second. So you and Tommy. He, that, safe to say, Foxhole Buddy with you pretty much your entire ascension in Late Show, right? He was there the whole time and 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 for the most part, right? I just lost you again. Oh, man. I don't know what's going on. Okay. That's okay. T uh, Tommy, Let me try this. Yeah, safe go ahead. to Sorry. say with Tommy, he was a Foxhole yeah. Buddy with you the whole time, right? Yeah. Well, he had, um, he became a writer when I was still on the production staff. I can't remember when. And then after I started as a writer, we were there together until he left to go to the nightly show with Larry Wilmore. So, yeah. Okay. But, uh, so how many yeah. It was always talking? really fun to, to watch him work. I'm sorry. What'd you say? How many years are we talking? Gosh, I, again, sometimes it's all mush. I don't yeah. remember. Probably uh, maybe four or five yeah. years, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, he is such a great guy. Um, is he yeah. a guy you've ever partnered up on anything with? No, um, we had dinner, though, uh, not too long ago, so it was really good to catch up and see how everybody's doing. He doesn't live too far from me in Jersey, um, so every once in a while I'll pass his exit on the parkway, and I'll be like, you know what, I should just give him a call and stop by. But, uh, yeah. yeah. We're, we're getting him back on the show. Um, I don't know if you saw Rupert's going away uh, video, the montage video. of. I did uh, see uh, some of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he gave a great toast, right? Well, he did. Okay, so I spoke. And then awesome. uh, my job was to bring up Tommy Ruprecht. And uh, oh, cool. so, so, and uh, uh, the, I think the, I believe the line was, um, and this is crazy because it was, I was freaked out as you can imagine, you know, speaking to that crowd of people, that particular crowd were literally there's Rob Burnett on that side. There's Barbara Gaines on that side. And, yeah. and for me, that was a, that was a very intimidating thing. And I think <laughs> I threaded the needle. Okay. Cause I went sentimental, but the way that That's I good. ended the talk, uh, I knew I had to bring up Tommy. And so I said, uh, and because he is the next speaker, I would like to bring up the funniest late show writer in history, Tommy Ruprecht. <laughs> 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 oh, 
<laughs> Looks, thanks for pissing off the whole room. And it was a, it was a fun little moment. I loved doing it. Um, oh, he's great. just such a great guy. And his, if it, the the mastermind, if you haven't watched his episode, it was really good. Uh, but the mastermind between uh, of of uh, great moments in presidential history, that yeah. phenomenal, phenomenal bit. And uh, that book, yeah. an offshoot, just like Steve's book, an offshoot of um, of, of a Letterman bit, uh, yeah. you know, Dave's record collection. Uh, Tommy yeah. also wrote a book off of a Letterman bit, really, essentially, yeah. is is, yeah. is the genesis of that. And and, yeah. and again, a lot of people- and He worked so hard on that. And this was back in the old analog days where you're watching speeches all day long. And just, you know, he was so- great just coming up with uh, finding those clips and just really made a defining segment for the show you know it's great yeah I, I think i people today don't they don't understand what you guys went through you as a researcher um mm -hmm. uh, you know and, and as a writer back then even the preparation there is no you know talking to a telephone give me the transcript of george bush on this day and this it, now that didn't exist back then that's yeah. you guys in front of a typewriter hitting rewind and yeah and, yeah no, I remember just having in the research department, having interns that we would have to send to the CBS magazine library to pull magazines because you couldn't just search, um, you know, the the Internet for stuff. And then you'd have to read the article and find the little anecdotes that weren't in their segment notes. I mean, it was really a different time, you know, and we I mean, obviously the show got a lot of magazines. So there was racks and it was like a library in there of like books, magazines, all kinds of things, celebrity memoirs um, that we used for segments. It was pretty interesting. Were you you were that guy too, right? You were a guy that would 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 pull some of this material as well at times as in part of your yeah. In my first six months there was a, yeah. a talent researcher, and so yeah. I I got the job doing that very thing. The, the assignment was researching Ricky Schroeder. I think I talked about this before. Yeah. But it was like spending a weekend just immersing myself in what was going on with Rick Schroeder, and it uh, it's just fascinating how whoever the guests were, that was your you got assigned a guest, and you just had to immerse yourself in what they were doing, you know. So. And the segment producers you were working for at the time, Matt Roberts, and who was the other one? It was Matt Roberts and Maria Pope. At the okay. Time. So yeah. with Matt and Maria, did they have different sensibilities as to like, okay, did they have a list of guests who were coming up kind of in the next month uh, or the next couple of weeks? And they would kind of give you lists of saying, okay, here's what, we need something for these people. We need something for these people. Would you look for different things based on the segment producer you were looking for? I don't know if it was for, based on the segment producer. I, they, they had a pretty good idea of who was going to do what guests and they wanted to be consistency. Do you know what I mean? So yep. they would often do the same guests. Sometimes there'd be overlap, but it was more about just trying to give them as much ammunition as you could that they could use in the pre-interview to help sort of craft that segment. Because uh, sometimes, you know, when you talk with a celebrity on the phone, sometimes they would come with, you know, stories ready to go with setups, you know, the punchlines, all that stuff. You know, Tom Hanks is an example. Someone who's awesome at that. But sometimes it was really having to pull teeth, just trying to find enough to get three or four anecdotes. I mean, you wanted to have like your core anecdotes, but then you wanted to have a couple of extras in case the segment went long, in case they sort of blew through them fast. Yep. So it's really a delicate dance. And they did a great job sort of figuring all that out. It was It was our job just to sort of say... This is what we have. And then it was also to find those things. Like I remember Mike Myers was on the show and I had to spend some time finding clips of an old Canadian show called um, Range Rider and the Calgary Kid where Mike <laughs> was, he was the, like a young child star. And it was basically me spending the day communicating with like a CBC, a CBC archivist CBC. Yep. who was super cool and was able to get us the stuff. But a lot of times it was like, this is really going to help make this segment. You know, Mike's super funny. But like to have this clip would be the extra thing at the end that we would really sell it and make it great, you know? So back then, um, were there ways that they could like beam it to you? It's not like they could just send it over a messenger at that point. You know, this is it'd be one of those things where I think we would have to coordinate like a, a link up between like the CBS broadcast center or our control room and an, a video booth at the CBC. So it got pretty intense. If you had enough lead time, they could say, we're going to send you four minutes of footage and we'll mail it to you and it'll get there in three days. Yeah. So sometimes you had enough lead time. Sometimes you were really just grinding it out that day, trying to figure it out. So thank you, thank you for this. I appreciate it. I know, I know the, the, the writer part um, is the part that a lot of people love. Everyone loves when the writers come on this, on, on this show, but the segment, like how the sausage gets made is just yeah. so fa endlessly fascinating to me. Let's go back to the box. What else we got? Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. Uh, okay, I think the books are done. We're going. We'll move to DVDs. Okay. Um, 
We have Get a Life, the complete series. There you go. Show. Yep. Fantastic. Worth the watch. How many uh, of the writers okay. were influenced by Chris Elliott over the years? I think every, I I, I feel yeah. like it's a hundred percent. I believe everybody was just, I mean, we, Chris, he is, he knows about us. We've gone back and forth a couple of times, very kind, extremely kind and gracious. Um, I don't know if there's somebody who has been more audacious on screen and gracious off screen than than yeah. Chris Elliott and, and humble um yeah, yeah. Than, than Chris Elliott it's worth, it's, place. it'll be worth the wait for you to get Chris and obviously Adam Resnick too who helped create the show just genius geniuses you know really really great guys absolutely wow. all right I have uh Andy Kindler's stand-up special I wish I was bitter <laughs> I worked with Andy on a ton of remotes at the end um sort of the I think we did like 25 field pieces together so that he was really great to work with was he fun uh, on the road like like did you guys hang out outside of when the cameras were there and production was happening like he seems like he'd be a fun guy to hang out with yeah he was always fun to hang out with yeah yeah we would hang out a lot we'd go out to dinner uh, so if I was in LA sort of we'd try to meet up and uh grab a bite to eat with his wife Susan uh yeah he's a great guy and it was always road fun to hang out on the road a, I was going to say road warrior. Like there's a guy who, who, who knows how to live on the road. Right. You know, we went all over, you know, we went to space camp, super bowls, <laughs> spring training. I mean, it was really fun, really cool. We put him in that little gyroscope thing at space camp, which, you know, sometimes, you know, I asked him to do things that were, you know, just ridiculous. You know, he was always a great sport, you know, one of my, one of the craziest things was when we did the, uh, we did a segment um, where we sent Andy to the toy fair at the Javits center. Yep. And it was going to be, a, you know, one of your standard Letterman pieces where it's just him trying out different toys, making fun of the vendors, whatever. And about 40 minutes into the shoot, we got to this um, booth where they had um, pogo sticks. Yeah. And I'm like, why don't you just hop on one? It'll be fun. We'll get some B-roll of you hopping on a pogo stick. Oh, no. And within about, uh, he tried once and sort of stumbled off, tried again and did a couple of bounces. And the third time it was this hard concrete floor at the Javits center and it just landed and he slipped and fell right on his back. And so it was one of those moments where we're just like, Oh, did we just injured the talent. Like, what are we going to do? You know? <laughs> and so we stopped everything and we were like, and he seemed like he was okay. He hurt his back. He tweaked it. We were going to go get it checked at the Javits center triage center or whatever. Sure. Yep. I called, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, I think I called the head writers. I think I called, uh, <laughs> maybe Paula Shigeras. I was like trying to figure out like, do we even continue with this? And we made the decision to continue filming as he went to get checked out. Right. And so the rest of the segment became Andy being examined by different doctors. We went to see Dr. Lou Aroni. We went to like uh, <laughs> all these different places and it turned into a really fascinating, it was a fun, interesting piece, except for the fact that Andy got really hurt a little bit, yeah. you know? Well, you know, you got to take one for the team sometimes. Um, yeah. You can't make an omelet without whatever, you know, all those, exactly. all those, all those fun little analogies. Yeah. Uh, I wish Don were here. Don, Don was going to potentially come on this episode, but we're going to note he'll watch it. And uh, if this isn't in a collection somewhere, uh, we'll try and find a way for that to happen. Great. Yeah, that's a fun, it was a let, fun one. Let Walter know. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really cool. And again, how sometimes comedy shows up in the unexpected places. So yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, Andy and Kindler, then, there we go. Yeah, it's yeah, beautiful that great. you have that. He's okay. great. Uh, the other DVDs I have, these are DVDs that are near and dear to my heart. We use them on the show in various ways for just little clips here and there. I have um, Peter Jackson's Dead Alive, Megaforce. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Break Into Electric Boogaloo and uh, Night of the Lepus. Uh, and this is about those giant killer rabbits. And we'd end up using this like, you know, around Easter or something, if we needed a quick clip, those are always fun to have. So mega force. I'm trying to, I remember you guys have definitely used, did you use mega force multiple times? I'm sure we used it multiple times when it was like the U S government's developing a new weapon and it's, <laughs> yes. you know, very Boswick on the flying uh, motorcycle or whatever. Uh, but there's so many great clips in that. Oh, that's great. I remember watching that when I was like nine years old and it was like the best movie I ever saw. You know what I mean? Yep. Oh, yeah, movies like... it, it, it still holds up. <laughs> yeah. Just in a different, just in a different way. But, in a different way. But you look yes. at it um, a little less, uh, you don't look at it as critically. You look at it as more of a comfort food, you know? 
Mine was Maximum Overdrive. Uh, uh sure. you know, the Stephen King one, the 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 possessed semi truck. Um, yeah. you know, as yeah. a kid, it's like it, it captures the imagination, that stuff. Yeah. That's fantastic. For sure. And uh shout out with with that, um, you know, that's in the spirit of if there was a, a baton being passed from Shecky, uh, you know, you know, gosh, the last time you were on, Shecky was still with us, and now Shecky's not with yeah. us anymore. And I just uh, well, he is. He's here in every episode. He was the best. Episode. He was the best. And that's yeah. that's the spirit of the show that he helped create from the very beginning. And that's what you're talking about. These are the clips that you remember. He would put the clips that he remembered when he was a kid on, you know, yeah. um, 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 going through. I used to go to his office. I used to stand in the door and he'd have like a big uh, container of pretzels. And I'd lean there and he'd be like, what do you need? And I'd be <laughs> like, and I just come up with, you know, I just sort of say what the writers are looking for. He'd roll his eyes and he'd be like, let me see what I got. He was just always so gracious, you know, and he was really sort of helpful to me, especially in those early days of just really coming through like time and again with interesting, unique stuff that really helped, you know, make, save, save the day a lot of the time, you know. Um, you you mentioned the uh, the eye roll, what do you need uh, on the first episode you're on? I'm glad you mentioned it here because yeah. you... Uh, again he was with us uh when when you and i recorded the first time that yeah. is exactly the tone that i felt that exact same thing whenever he and i would start a phone conversation if i'd say hey got a second chat and and yeah. he would pick up the phone that that hey how can i help mike like what do you mm -hmm. mean like you know um that's exactly it but you knew that he absolutely wanted to help and that was just his delivery See, the he thing is that i don't think it was like he didn't want to deal with it no. I, I think it was one of these things like he it was like he had been in the trenches doing that for so long and he saw someone else who was doing things he used to have to, and he sort of so he totally sympathized wanted to help and was always there to sort of bring you along you know absolutely like with us yeah. it was that what do you need and then it would end up in a, in a wonderful two-hour phone conversation yeah it was just it was just no. I, we miss him so, so damn much. Yeah. Um, he was a special and, guy. He really yeah. was. And you showing Megaforce is just like him at the very beginning, showing these, you know, old school stuff that he would show the black and white stuff and whatnot. And that was something that a baton that passed on. Yeah. You guys would always use crazy, silly footage uh, for something serious. It was a joke that never got old because the clip that you would throw in there um, would be so great. Uh, Conan did it with with Paul Rudd. You know the the Mac and Me thing that he the Mac and Me. Sure. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I just such a it's such a beautiful callback that I believe started with Late Night. There is a um, a, a Get a Life episode that's a Mac and Me ET parody that's that features an alien called Spewy <laughs> that's really worth watching. And it's like Chris, uh, he he's like secretes goo from under his like gills or something and chris drinks it and he calls it the nectar of the gods like it's so it's so weird and awesome um but yeah that was what was, i loved about the show is just how everything sort of interconnects like this and it's all you know just shecky was so great about helping everybody yeah absolutely um thank you for that little segue there what else we got yeah. in the box let's do back it. to the box back to the box um, okay i have a couple of t-shirts i have three t-shirts i have uh Late Show 20th Anniversary t-shirt. Bam. Right there, baby. Oh, look at that. There you go. <laughs> Love it. Love it. How much did you pay for it? Can I put it online and make something from this or no? I, I, unfortunately, it was a gift. Unfortunately. I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> but yes, you could. I got. You I have this could. one. This is Where's the uh, one? shirt. This is the shirt Dave gave out after his heart surgery. Oh, that's the heart surgery shirt. Oh. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It's got the date on the sleeve, 1-14-2000. One, uh, oh, and there's his scar right in the middle of it. That's yep. beautiful. Uh, let's see. And then I have uh, Late oh. Show Technical Maintenance t-shirt. <laughs> All right, this on. Segment in the later years called the Late Show Technical Maintenance Minute, where we would bring the technical maintenance guys out, and they would do this really long-winded uh, detailed explanation of some new technology at the show. Yep. And that was ended with um, all the guys like Gary Mintz. It was like Mike Azzarello, Steve Estomsky, Tom Herman, all these awesome crew guys. And then all in unison say the slogan for technical maintenance that we came up with. Uh, Lee and I, I think, came up with this slogan. It was, uh, it ain't broke if we can fix it. So that that's always a fun. And, and the volleyball I wanted to set. Hey, who wrote that? Uh, who wrote that segment, Jeremy? What's that? I said, uh, this is oh, yeah. volleyball. Who wrote that segment? That's exactly. your segment. That, right? was a, that's your... that was one of those fun things too, where you know, you go down into the bowels of the theater 
and you go to the technical, the tech lounge or the control room, and you'd be looking for Gary Mintz to see like what he was working on and try to find him. And then you spend like 15, 20 minutes asking like, did you get any new technology? Is there any <laughs> new machine that you can sort of describe the inner workings of? And it was always just fun to sort of see them go on stage and they'd all sit on folding chairs in a little half circle. It was fun. So we got to do, uh, we got to get Walter to do, to give that segment some love on the official channel. That's uh, yeah, for you're sure. right. That's one that needs to be, that's a stone that needs to be returned again. And then I have a, two copies of uh, Lake Show Fun Facts. Excellent. Uh, how many of any, uh, any idea how much you're represented in that book? Oh, fun facts. I would say a little bit, a little bit. Fun okay. facts is one of those ones. Uh, yeah. I, I would say I can't even give you a percentage, yep. but I would say like the guys that like Lee, Joe, Steve, those were the guys that were, you know, uh, for, for me, like, I, I think I talked about this before you find your role and what you're good at and the, yeah. the sort of way they were able to come up with these clever you know, the way they could take just an existing fun fact and make it just and elevate it with just some change of a word here or there. They were just so good at that. I was OK, but they were really good. The Stangles were really good. So I was happy to get some jokes in there and just participate. You know, it was a really fun sort of thing to be a part of. Something that the show did right from the very beginning. Um, we've got a uh, well, there. We I always move things around up here, but we've got examples of it. The 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 top ten book. Uh, I don't know how many years, you know, the the the, the original late night book came out. Um, but then the, the official production, uh, publications would come out, you know, yeah. the top 10 ones, something that happened the whole way through the run. And, and, uh, cause the fun facts book that came out in what the mid two thousands, I think it's probably the early to mid two thousand. Maybe 2008. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 2008. You know, and that's a, that's a storied, uh, tradition too, that, that, that the show was so relevant, uh, yeah. that it justified publications, uh, other publications that we've talked about yeah. a couple of them there. So yeah. that's a, Tommy that's has a bunch of jokes and Tommy has a bunch of jokes in there too. They're really fun. Bill Sheft also. Oh yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny too, cause I can look at the jokes and I can be like, Oh, I think that's a Ruprecht. I think that's a, you know, Joe Grossman. I think that's Steve. So it's fun to sort of look through it. So you have enough fun facts to assemble a book. Um, now that being said, is that, a result of stuff that would have kind of been on the cutting room floor. We know we're doing the fun facts tonight. So we're going to churn in, you know, 50 fun facts for tonight's segment. Four are going to get chosen or five are going to get chosen. Um, but we're going to archive these and we're going to make a book. Is that how that process happened? Or was there like an actual, uh, okay, we know we're making a book for this. So we're going to take a couple afternoons and bang some of these out. I know there was, um, I think it was a little bit of both. I think it okay. was, we're going to use ones that were really, that we really liked that were on the show. We're going to yep. look through all the old passes and see if there's any we missed. We also did passes of things. Like one of the jokes I know I have in here that I thought was, it was about, um, it's like fun facts, merchandise or something. Okay. Uh, so basically, oh, so there's different jokes in here. Like there's a timeline of the FBMI, which was uh, the Federal Bureau of Miscellaneous Information. There was also like merch, I think about the FBMI. And I think I had like one that was like liturgical vestments that said the FBMI, which I thought was just stupid. There was also rejected fun facts in here. Um, but I think it was a little bit of everything. And I think as you get closer to sort of a deadline to turn stuff in, it was maybe we did a couple of passes of just, you know, we need a few extra for the book to put through or whatever. Um, I, I'm really careful when I ask about money on these things here. I try and keep it as, as general as possible. Um, unless I'm talking with Morty off camera, then I ask yeah. all the money questions. Uh, but when it comes to you as a writer and yeah. a special project like this comes up, um, yeah. is there, I mean, I, 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 let me be as naive as I possibly can. Is there financial incentive for you guys to want to be a part of this? Like, is this something that uh, you get? Yeah, paid I, I don't remember how much, but there was, there. we did get paid, I think a little stipend maybe yeah. to do it. I can't remember how much it was. It wasn't like, you know, earth shattering money. I do remember I something funny that happened is that once it was published, we all got, a. Um, we were all like, oh my gosh, we're going to get like, uh, you know, cases of these things to give out to our family and friends. Right. And so we got, we got one. Right. Oh, here's your here's your <laughs> so, copy of the. Book. And so we were like, wait a second, is there any way we could just get you know any more? And so we got one more, so we got two. So I think I have two. So that's here. why you have two in the box because those are the two the show gave you. I think I might have given one away and maybe got. I might have purchased. I, I I probably bought one on Amazon at one point to sort of have just as a keepsake. Uh, the and it helped drive the of... boost those sales numbers, you know. <laughs> Maybe we'll find of... a contract in here for it. If there's a contract in here, I'll let you know how much I got. <laughs> that 
that's right. I don't even care how much. It's just more like the, uh, you know, writers. Are, okay, yeah, let's do this. We got a book opportunity here. Yeah, this I think it's in your writers movie. guild contract that you have to get something. Yeah, there's so there's got to be something. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, um, I have an envelope here. Oh boy. This looks like just some dubs of segments. Nothing crazy. Dubs of segments. Dubs of like um. This could be like cutting room floor segments. stuff. This is uh, we did a remote at the uh, with the United States Marshal Service, and so they they were filming also and sent me like some of the B roll that they shot that we could use. We sent Andy Kindler to the U.S. Marshal's headquarters, uh, and we did like he broke into like buildings, like they did raids on houses. They did driving training. It was really fun. I see. So uh, uh, now that we know that these exist um, and we have footage uh, that made the show or potentially uh, didn't make the show. Um, okay. We'll talk off camera about that. <laughs> Any labels? Can you go through uh, like uh, that, I'm, that? I'm really fascinated with that. Let's not skip by those there. Uh, this okay, one says, um, this one just says um, it's an Andy Kindler segment. I don't know which one. Okay. This one is... Uh, these look like some scripts. It's a CD of like scripts and stuff that I backed up to save. So I must have, I should go, I, I should look through that and see some old stuff. This is, uh, I don't know what this is. I think this is, this looks like this has an industrial musicals business card. It looks like there's five songs on here that Steve might have burned of like old industrial musicals, maybe. Awesome. This is files that I backed up in 2012 and the u.s marshals thing and then there's a document here that has um a list of some segments that i wrote just to save the dates for and then um what is this and then a couple of appearances that i made on the show as extras that i could keep in my files oh fantastic it was like we talked about last time the, the, the dave hangs with the interns thing yep. that i did when i was an intern yep there was another one where I was a CBS page. There was another one where um, it was in um, March 6, 2000. Yep. It was it was around the time of the Oscars. And Paul, Dave, the joke was that Paul was nominated for an Oscar. And I think I was a corpse on 53rd Street and Paul was cradling me. And he looks <laughs> up at the jib and he screams, no, like it was one of those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the show oh, and then there's the something here. We did Staffer, Not a Staffer. Do you remember that segment? I don't. There was a segment called Staffer, Not a Staffer. And we would bring out on the show someone who either worked on the staff or didn't. And Dave and Paul had to discuss whether they thought the person actually worked on the show or didn't. And we did it a bunch of times. So I was one of them. It was uh, April 28th, 2000. And I think they said I was a staffer. So I felt a tremendous sense of relief. Yeah. But we brought in actors in sort of street clothes or that looked like writers and they would have to guess whether or not they were a staffer or not. So that was pretty fun. You got mild recognition from Dave and Paul. Uh, no bigger of a badge of honor than that. Um, exactly. Do you still have devices that can open up these uh, these these compact discs? Because I know people it's, who do. It's going to have to. I, I might have a CD player. That's another one that might be in a box in the attic. But I got to look <laughs> up. This physical media thing going away really threw me for a loop. So I got to get some stuff out and check them out. Hey, you know, we know a guy. Who uh, yeah. was actually a friend of the show? Who would be happy to? Uh, I'm sure you have we'll it. Talk. In. We'll talk. I'm we'll not talk that much camera. of a luddite. I think I have it here. I just have to go find it. <laughs> Let's keep rolling. Very cool that you have this stuff, Jeremy. Oh man, that's awesome. That's like pay uh, dirt for this show. <laughs> I have um, a copy of Emmy magazine. I don't. I think I don't know why I got sent this. I don't know what's in here. It might be an interview with the writers. Are you uh, a member of the Academy? There was a time um, that I was a member of the TV Academy when yeah. you, after being nominated for a period of time, yep. you, you can be a member of the Academy if you pay like $200 a year in dues. Yep. So, and I think you get Emmy Magazine for free. So I think for a short period of time, I was. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Super cool. Uh, this this is something I think Steve Young gave as a Christmas gift to oh, everyone. Man, Steve Young it's um, gifts. the best of Late Show Chiron quiz does this show up backwards on your screen? I can't tell. It says the no, best of Chiron quiz perfect. A's and B's. Okay. Yep. Uh, and it says 1993 to 2004. So when we did Chiron quizzes, he he compiled every A and B. So not the joke, but it was just every A and B from the Chiron quizzes. So it makes it's just this random assortment of phrases. Uh, it's the best. Steve showed yeah. that to me. Uh, we went through an, a, a tour in his apartment, and he sent me the digital file of that. It is oh, hysterical. Great. 
it's yeah. hysterical. Like when yeah. you go through it, it's just like you say, random sentences. Yeah. And when you read 10 or 11 of them, it starts it's, to get really funny. It's, <laughs> like funny. it's just, it's, oh. It is funny. That's that was one of my favorite traditions is when uh, at the time you're like, oh, I don't really want to go in to work on Thanksgiving. But then when you get in there and we got in at like seven in the morning and we we're watching the Thanksgiving parade, working on Chiron quiz footage. So hanging out with everybody in the morning before you had, you know, Thanksgiving at the show, that was always a fun sort of, you know, tradition for the writers to be doing the Chiron quizzes on Thanksgiving. So it's fun to look through those, you know. That's fantastic. Uh, you want to keep going and getting more? Yes. Are, are you, oh, Jeremy, are you kidding me? All right, let's keep no going. way, man. <laughs> All right, I got a couple of envelopes. Excellent. Uh, okay, this is when the show is nominated for writing. You get, um, for, for an Emmy for writing, you get a certificate, which is really cool. So I have yep. a couple of those. Oh, that's, what a great keepsake that is. There are people yeah. who would frame those and put them on a wall. That's a, that's a really cool. Well, we can get to that point. We're, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out. We, I have a couple of things framed um, in different spots, but. Oh, okay. We'll go through, uh, um, let's see. Uh, this is what you get at the show when you got inner office mail. So okay. you get these in your door, okay? This is a CBS inner office. So I Probably something. delivered by Bob Borden. Yes. <laughs> uh, it says, ah, too late show from Janice Panino, 12104. Regarding the writer's researcher position, congratulations, Jeremy Weiner, who has been promoted to writer. Oh, and so this is, is basically a um, anyone who wants to apply for that the, that writer's researcher job, mm -hmm. go for it. <laughs> All right, let's see. Shout out this to Janice, who's been on the show as well. We love Janice. What's that? Shout out to Janice, who's been on the oh, show. Oh, shout as out well. to Janice. Janice, Janice is awesome. Yep. She was always so great to me and um, just super great. Love yep. Janice. Yeah, me too. All right. Um, this is some stuff that I used to have on the wall in my office. Some of it, I don't know why. Some of it, I just liked. This is, um, this is one of my favorite shows, the A-Team. That's the oh, A-Team. Oh, I love it when a plan comes together. I had this little baby with a mustache, which I think I used as like an avatar for a while. Mm -hmm. I have a photo of uh, Billy D. Williams. <laughs> I have... Um, Photo of David Carradine wearing a sport coat and no shirt. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Oh. This is a, a I can see why you're so cool. You take influence from the best sources. Yes. That's fantastic. Those two, Billy D. Williams and David Carradine. Um, yep. This is um, something my daughter made for me. It says, to dad, robot. And it's awesome. just a robot. I have a letter here. Let's see. This would be the one that's in college right now? That would be probably my younger one, who's a junior. Okay. I think it was my younger. Gotcha. Um, this is from 2005, January 2005. This was, there was always a, a struggle for, to figure out what to get Dave for Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've heard about this struggle from multiple sources. Yes. Always. So one year I was out and I saw some new technology at the time in 2005. That I'm like, you know what? He's not going to get this from anyone else. I'm going to get it. And let's just, you know what? He might, he may use it. He may actually use it. This was new technology for me. It says, dear Jeremy, I've, I'm always on the lookout for new kitchen tools. Thanks for the silicone potholder set. It will be put to good use. <laughs> Have a lovely holiday, Dave. <laughs> I was such an idiot. I got David Letterman silicone potholders for Christmas. I was like, this is new technology. He likes to cook. He'll use it. I don't know. It was one. It wasn't in my budget to get him a new fishing rod, or you know, at the yeah. time, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, anyway. It's the thought that counts. And by the way, we're talking about a guy who, when he got an iPad, used it to chop. I think he was chopping avocados or something on the desk with the yeah. iPad yeah. Uh, when it came out. So you know, you never know what he might have used them for. That is yeah. so precious. Like that is that is really 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 sweet. Um, yeah. And, and <laughs> so stupid. It's great. This is another thing. There was the, this, this photo. I'm trying, I don't remember the exact piece, but I think Lee Ellenberg and I were working on a piece. It was about, it was a, a mini series about the presidents, uh, the US presidents or something. And we, so we did a, a whole series of who, which actors were playing different roles in the presidential mini series. And this was a photo I had on my wall. We cast, uh, this was our dream casting. Uh, it was uh, Ving Rames and Danny DeVito as Ron <laughs> and Nancy Reagan. And I don't know what, I don't know what the rest of them were. This was just on the wall forever. So I, I don't know. Oh, that's fantastic. 
Oh, that's fantastic. And then uh, <laughs> this is an autographed photo of Lou Ferrigno. Uh, it mm -hmm. says, to Jeremy, all the best, um, Lou Ferrigno the Hulk. Okay. Yep. I got this when we covered the, uh, we went to the San Diego Comic Con. Yep. I don't remember the year. It might have been 2000. It might have been pretty early. It might have been 2004 because I might have still been before I was a writer. Yep. And I went with Craig Thomas and the correspondent was Mark Borchart and Mike Shank from American yep. Movie. Do you know that documentary? From which documentary? It's called, the documentary is American Movie. Mark Borchart from Wisconsin. It's yep. a fantastic. Mark Borchart was a, he is a, a filmmaker from Wisconsin. It's called American Movie. And uh, his friend, Mike Shank, who sadly recently passed away, but they were the correspondents at Comic-Con with us. And so we bumped into Lou Ferrigno. That, that piece is worth looking at. It's fascinating. We bumped into Lou Ferrigno. He shot something with the two of them to be on the show. And so yep. I'm like, this is great. Uh, maybe I can get his autograph because I love Lou. Yep. And then he signs this for me, hands it to me. And then I, I was about to walk away and he goes, it's $20. <laughs> 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 and so... <laughs> I thought we had had a transactional thing where he was going to be on TV and I would get an autograph out of it. And instead he was there to do, do business. And it was, uh, <laughs> I saw at our hotel, Frank Gorshin in the carport of a Hampton Inn who played the Riddler on the original, the yep. old Batman series. Yep. He had a stack of $20 bills from his autographs that was like this high yep. and he was just counting his loot. And so I get it. These guys went there to make their money. I totally get it. For sure. Happy to give him the 20 bucks. So I don't have it in here. I'm looking for it uh, desperately as you're showing that. Um, I've got my Sarah Palin photo there. I don't know where the Lou Ferrigno photo went. I literally have a uh, him as the Hulk to Mike. Good luck with the podcast, Lou Ferrigno. Oh, Hulk, and I wanted to show it to you, but That's it's uh, it's it's not in the studio right now. But yeah, a hell That's of a great. guy too. He's he's really really sweet. Yeah. Um, I, I when I talked to him though, it was more recently. And uh, um, I, I talked to him about about his role on The Offer. I don't know if you watch The Offer or not. No, uh -uh. Uh, I'm a big Godfather fan. Highly recommend it. And I know it's really? on the Paramount. Okay, good. It's on the Paramount Plus, and it's the it's the story of how The Godfather got made. Yeah. And um, Lou was brought in to play the guy who played Luca Brasi in the in the in the Godfather. Oh wow, and, that's cool. And and I he he wasn't in the show very much, but you remembered it every time you saw him, and so. When I, everyone at who wanted who was meeting him that night, it was at a winery. It was kind of bougie, and yeah. and 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 uh, everyone was talking to him about the Hulk and the Hulk. And of course, he was saying all the things that he he normally says. And I said to him, "Hey, man, uh, yeah, Hulk, awesome, love it, totally. I'm a Marvel kid, yes, but uh, can I talk to you about the offer?" And he lit up like a Christmas tree. And oh, that's he, great. We're talking about the Godfather and how he got to play that role. Uh, highly recommend the offer to anybody who likes the Godfather or Lou Ferrigno cool. for that matter. It's very, very, very good show. Um, nice. Uh, yeah. What else we got in the box? Uh, okay. And then um, let's see. Hold on. All right. Then I have one photo in here. Okay. I'll give you a little context. We were talking about this before about things that you shoot for the show that get cut out. Yes. That don't air. Yes. There was a segment that got shot for the show. It was featuring uh, the actor Hardy Rawls, I think. And he was playing a staffer who was retiring. And they built a fake montage uh, of his greatest moments from the show. But he never actually appeared in those moments on the show. <laughs> and so one of the one of the costumes he was in was he was dressed as a superhero. And his um, emblem on his chest, it said Viagra Man. And he had, it was a red bodysuit with a yellow cape. And so... The segment never aired, but the costume was lying around Sue Hum's wardrobe room. Holy there, crap. There was a time when, uh, I forget which writers were down there, but they saw the suit, and I was a, an intern at the time, and they bet me, the writers came upstairs with the costume, and they uh, they bet me that I wouldn't wear the costume for a full week uh, to and from the show on my commute from New Jersey <laughs> all day at the show, and then home at night and as an intern i'm like uh, they were going to give me some money right so it was like four writers who were going to pay like a hundred dollars they're like we'll each give you a hundred dollars if you wear and i was like i had no money i'm like yes i'll do this and so i wore it every day for a full week to and from the show i had to wear the goggles that came with it the cape and everything and so here's a photo of me in the suit with lee ellenberg and john bobby who was a writer's researcher at the time and that's me in the Viagra man suit. And obviously, you know, I'm a, a, a huskier fellow. And so seeing me in a skin tight bodysuit uh, certainly was entertaining for some, I, I suppose. And uh, 
So I did it for a full week to and from work. I get home every night. I had to wear it in the subway. Uh, my wife, uh, we were engaged at the time. I went to visit her at her office and I got kicked off the block by security at her office. It was insane. And then at the end of the week, the writers all came in and they each gave me, I think it was like two, maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars. And uh, then a couple of other writers who weren't involved. It's just like, you son of a bitch, you did it. They came in and gave me money. I think I ended up paying my entire college uh, living, ex my, my, my internship living expenses through wearing that suit for a week, which was bonkers. This might be the greatest behind the scenes staff story ever told on this show. That it is was, absolutely awesome. It was uh, wild. There was one time when I got asked by the Stangles to bring something down to the stage during rehearsal. Uh -huh. And it was nothing of substance. And I'm just, uh -huh. why did I have to do this? And it was just, uh, Dave was in the corner and someone said that he just wanted to see me in the suit. <laughs> and so then I walked back upstairs. So it just, look, I got, I brought some joy to some people. Uh, it gave me a little, uh, a good story to tell, but it was fascinating. So this is the part where, you know, you talk about the interns and, and sometimes an intern would come in and they would become part of the family and get yeah. brought into the family. And that they would literally go on to become something that they might not have been on the trajectory to to, be, to become yeah. um this is the integration this is how it happened this is okay yeah. are you you kind of one of us and it's not a matter of hazing or anything like that it's a matter of do you have that askew sensibility <laughs> and it's like are you are you game to sort of just go go with the flow and it was you know they were so welcoming and nice and so we yeah. had, had obviously built a rapport up to this point so it wasn't like my first week no and they said absolutely. hey you want to do this so we had you know been working together almost a month and a half two months and, you know, they sort of saw that I got the sensibility of the show, that I was one of those nose to the grindstone, do the work. But then it was, you know, that that moment where you get invited in to be sort of part of the club. And, you as, you know, I was a young kid. I was like, yes, this is where I want to be, what I want to do. Yeah, I just want to make these guys laugh. You know what I mean? And that was part of it. So if there was a way I could participate in some small way just to sort of feel a little more connected to them, that was absolutely what I wanted to do. Um, two things. Number one, I need you to take a digital photo of that uh, picture and send it to me. We just found yeah. the thumbnail for this episode. Uh, sure. um, and number two, um, I can only imagine Janice Panino, who looked at her interns like a friggin' Bo Peep with her little sheep that she wants to make sure that she protects, uh, mm -hmm. or a sheep dog sometimes as well, because yeah. you know she wanted to protect yeah. her interns. I can only imagine. The look on her face, you know, maybe she's walking through the hall or something like that. And she looks and there's Jeremy walking by in a, in that suit and just yeah. shaking her head going, OK, that's what they got to doing this week. Yeah. Like, wow. And the that funny is thing is, the first couple of days, it was a lot of double takes and a lot of like, <laughs> are you kidding me with this guy? And I'm sure the other interns are like rolling their eyes going like, what is this? You know, what is he doing? <laughs> but then by like day five, it was one of those things where it was like, oh, He's sticking with it. Good for him. You know, yeah. he's riding it out. Mm -hmm. He did it. So, yeah, it was fast. It was really, it was one of those moments y'all ne definitely never forget for sure. Uh, you, you said it was four writers. Do you remember which four it was? Uh, you know, I think the initial group was like Justin, Eric, yeah. um, Carter, Craig. And then I think right. at one point, <laughs> I think at one point Chris Harris was there and he came over. He just goes, you bastard. And he put like 200, like $150 <laughs> on the table. So it was one of those things like I think they didn't I think they thought maybe by day three I would bail. And I had to commute like an hour and a half uh, to New Jersey on the train. And so like when I got home at night, I wore like a T-shirt under this suit. Right. Because I didn't want to sure. just wear this like suit. Yeah. And it was like the red from the bodysuit had like bled into the T-shirt. It was just a disaster. But it was uh, really worth it in the end. And uh, you showed your fiance at the time that you were able to commit. And that's and that's look right. what's happened since then. That's right. Look at us now. This is my yep. favorite. This is my favorite. All right, here we go. Okay, let's um, keep going. Oh, all right. Here's in related to that. Yep. Related um, to that. Th Excellent. Th when I got hired as a late show researcher, <laughs> this is what the script cover was. It was, it says the new late show researcher. Uh, welcome Jeremy. And that was Maybe another intern, Taryn, Taryn Brill, who uh, worked with me. Oh God. How ridiculous. Taryn Brill. Yeah. Familiar, Taryn went to Brill. The familiar last name is uh, any relation to Eddie. No, I don't think so. Okay. No, I think that's gotcha. just coincidental. But she went on to um, be like a, she's a journalist. She's like a correspondent for different uh, TV and news organizations. Fantastic. Uh, all right. Let's see what this one is. This is another inner office envelope. Yep. 
Oh. Oh, this says um, this is it says WGA on strike, mm -hmm. and on the front it says this is um, so basically this is a compilation someone made of the Late Show Writers on Strike dot com website from two thousand and seven two thousand eight. So whatever was on our website, they put into book form, uh, and it has everyone's pictures and it has um, all the little um, stuff that people posted on the website. So that was pretty cool. That's very cool. Uh, cool would that have been sure. produced in house, like? Like yeah, I think the, it must have been maybe the Stangles compiled it. Maybe Steve did. I can't remember who did, but it was kind of like a keepsake for the um, after that strike, which was uh, a crazy experience for sure. That might be something Don doesn't have. Uh, that's going to be interesting to see his reaction to seeing that. Yeah, he's yeah. Let me know. He's either going to send me a picture. That, that's what he'll do sometimes is, is if, you know, we'll talk about something and then I'll just get a random photo. And yeah. there it is him holding it. <laughs> yeah that's a that's a really cool uh keep saying yeah yeah i think this i think the site might still be active late show writers on strike.com i think oh man I i'm so. not sure yeah okay we'll give that site some love Absolutely. but everybody contributed little things here and there so bill shaft bob warden steve young joe grossman yeah okay perfect that's excellent a nice little rabbit hole there this yeah. is one of my favorite episodes ever, just so you know. Uh, this is fantastic. We're having a ball. All right, good. If, if, if it gets boring at any point, just click uh, disconnect and send me on my way. You've said that so many times. This is not going to get boring. We're good, right. my friend. Um, all right. So this I have. These are lanyards from pieces that I've worked remotes. on. So places, remotes we've gone to. So yeah. we have um, the World Series with the Yankees in 2009. Uh, Super Bowl 38. Uh, I don't know what that one was. This is another Yankee. We were there on March 6th also. This is the World Series pass. This is, we did a remote on a submarine in Groton, Connecticut, a uh, top 10 list with 10 Navy submariners. And this is the on-base uh, personal identifier from Groton, Connecticut, the submarine base. Oh, wow. And let me tell you, if you thought I looked weird in that bodysuit, me fitting into a submarine and through those hallways... <laughs> Not so easy. Uh, I, I got to ask this question. You you mentioned, um, you know, Yankee games, World Series, yeah. uh, 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 Super Bowl. You go for these remotes and obviously you're looking for the joke and, yep. and, and, and you got a lot of work to do. Are you able to watch the game while you're there? No. Okay. You're, I mean, a lot, a lot of people ask that question and, and you're on the field pregame. So you would get to yeah. get immersed in pregame warmup, which is fascinating. Once yeah. the game starts though, you're in the concourse interviewing fans. So you're able to look up on the monitor to sort of see what's happening a little bit. Yeah. Um, but you generally know, and then sometimes you're in the, um, in the um, uh, luxury boxes at halftime and you could see onto the field and see some of the halftime show. Yeah. Did I tell you the story about Johnny Knoxville there? I think I did. did uh, Johnny Knoxville, the Super Bowl? I don't think so. There was a, I'll tell it very quickly. I was there with Tommy. Tommy may have told you, but we were interviewing celebrities in the luxury box at halftime and we saw Johnny Knoxville in one of the, the luxury boxes. He comes out and Biff says, um, uh, just real quick, Tommy whispers to Biff, can you do a stunt for us? And so Biff says, uh, can you do a stunt for us? And Johnny Knoxville goes, sure. He goes and he does something called, um, he says, I'm going to do something called a tequila stunt man. So he comes out with salt, a lime, and uh, a, a shot of tequila, right? Mm -hmm. So normally you lick the salt, yep. drink the tequila, and then you yep. eat the lime, right? Mm -hmm. So the tequila stuntman is Johnny does the shot of tequila. He snorts the salt, or I think, he, or maybe it's the other way. He snorts the salt, does the shot of tequila, and then he squeezes the lime in his eye. <laughs> and that was the, the tequila stuntman. And it was in that Super Bowl remote. I don't know what year it was, but it was so great. And it was just one of those moments you're like, this is... Um, so sometimes you go to the Super Bowl, you're not sure what you're going to get. Sometimes the celebrities are duds. Sometimes they just end up in B-roll. Yeah. That was one of those things. At the moment it happened, you're like, this is in the piece and it's going to kill. It was good. It was great. Did he... Uh, I, I mean, I, the obvious question, I think I know the obvious answer. Uh, recognize Biff immediately. Recognize you guys are Letterman people immediately. Like Rep He recognized was Biff immediately. And yeah, that was the yeah. best part about going with Biff in the later days. Yeah. Everybody knew Biff. Yeah. So if we were blocked from something, if we weren't allowed to, you know, get get access to somewhere, people would see Biff and they'd let you through immediately. Yeah. Uh, there was only a couple of occasions where, like at the Super Bowl one year, we were about to go on the field for the post-game celebration, and um security had blocked us off. 
and we couldn't get on the field for the final celebration. So we we're like, oh no, we don't have an ending for the piece. But luckily we had met a security guard at check-in who knew Biff and we had hung out like all day. He saw us get denied. He ran over and said, they're good and let us onto the field. And we were able to get the celebration with the confetti. And it was just one of those things like, he, Biff was like the golden ticket sometimes. It was like, oh, Biff's going to be there. Sure, you can go talk to Stevie Wonder. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> awesome. You know, it was just really good. Yeah. So fantastic. Oh, yeah. Uh, here's the Comic Con one. So that Comic Con segment yep. with Mark Portrait was 2001. Yep. Wow, that was a long time ago. Some more yeah. World Series. This is the Republican National Convention in St. Paul, probably 2008, maybe. Wow. 2004. Um, what is this? Oh, this is more Republican convention we went to. Did you ever cross paths with Daily Show or Colbert back in the day? Like, uh, you know, other comedy shows who were- Not so much Daily Show and Colbert, but there was, I was just thinking about this earlier today. Uh, There was one Super Bowl where we were on the sideline right next to the Tonight Show crew. No kidding. Their their correspondent was Mitch Fattel. Okay. The comedian, the stand-up comedian. And it was one of those weird moments where you're like, oh, are they, like, are we- are they our nemesis? Are we supposed to be like, are we beefing with them? Like, what are we doing with these guys? Uh, but they were super cool and super nice. I think they ended up using a shot of Biff in their remote. Um, but it was one of those things, seeing them on the sidelines, seeing what they were doing, the questions yeah. they were asking, you're sort of sizing up who their writers are and trying to figure out like what their process is. Is it any different? And it's all very similar. And now when you look at the Super Bowl, you know, I spent like four days in uh, New Orleans with Grant Paulson and his father. Grant was a young kid correspondent who's now like a successful broadcaster. But um, we were there and it's just fascinating. Now, Now you see kids and celebrities at the Super Bowl all the time. But Dave was doing stuff before any of that. That's all sort of just, you know, he sort of, created this format of we're going to send kids we're going to ask wacky questions we're going to do this and that you know so this way absolutely uh and then guys, this is the last one the new york stock exchange oh yeah. so what did what did you do there we shot something with andy kindler and like paul krugman talking about like i don't know the economy it was <laughs> it was one of those things that ended up being a really funny piece but you go into it not knowing it's like you know you get a note from the head writers we got to write jokes about you know the, the stock market and you, you know you don't know what it is so but i had to wear a suit anyway <laughs> um just to go back real quick uh, about the, the the tonight show thing did you ever hear the yeah. story about rupert in la do i i don't know if you, know if you ever heard the story or not but uh not early, sure. early on um in uh in fun with rupert and this is like i think it's probably 96 or maybe 98 um you guys are uh the, or the show's in la doing its thing and they're doing fun with Rupert and there's two vans and the vans stopped for a while. Rupert was in the second van and there was a bunch of activity happening and, 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 and communication back and forth. And do we send them? Do we not send them? Do we send them? Do we not send them? And, and you looked out and there was a segment of jaywalking going on. Oh And, wow. <laughs> and the, the argument was, do we send Rupert over or That's not? Great. And wow. they didn't end up doing it. And to me, that might be one of the the the, the biggest um, missed opportunities that I've ever <laughs> heard. Uh, and I understand that are we rivals? Are we not? You know, uh, different guests on the show yeah. uh, have very strong opinions either way sometimes. And sometimes people are in the kind of in the middle, like they don't really know. Uh, yeah. But that is a, I didn't know if you'd ever heard that story. It's just weird that. how they convert. I may have heard it at some point. Like I said, yeah. sometimes it's all mush, but it's interesting yeah, yeah. how things converge like that. And really, at the end of the day, everyone's doing their own separate thing, you know, so yeah. it was no big deal. But um, that's really funny. That's interesting. Anyway, anyway yeah, let's, let's go back to the box. Here we go. OK. Um, all right. This is an envelope. OK, so very rarely did I get did I ask? I think I mentioned this before. Did I ask for an autograph? Right. Well, I tried my best to make it. The rule is it's a safe space for celebrities. Stay away. Yeah. Um, the, the, one of the exceptions was, I think we had the entire U S women's national soccer team on okay. after they won the world cup. So they autographed this, uh, Newsweek for me. So it's, uh, Brandy Chastain and Mia Hamm and all of them signed this, uh, this one. And then I went to Syracuse. Yes. And after they won the the national championship, they autographed, uh, Carmelo and Jerry McNamara and Jim Beheim autographed the sports illustrator for me. It's fantastic. So two little keepsakes. Ah, shout out to Sports right. Illustrated. Rest in peace. Can't believe that. I know, That's right? A, Crazy. 
That's this is one of those things I hope someone comes in and rescues it and realizes like this recognizable iconic brand can sort of be salvaged and repurposed. Yeah, and like the Twinkie. Yeah, like the like the Twinkie. I don't know how many times yeah. the Twinkie's gone out of business and been saved, but it's happened a Keep bunch. Coming back, keeps coming back. It gets a little smaller. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so then, oh, he have another gift from Steve Young. Uh, Happy Holidays, two thousand three. Have you seen this? Nope. It's a it's a it's a calendar that features all of the most mundane spots around the building that you see every day so this was the hallway going to the control room that's january this was the this is the coffee area on the writer's floor just all very drab uh, this is the elevator buttons that you hit every day um that's the photocopier you just see this every day just nothing um what else let's see if there's anything really interesting. Oh, I love <laughs> this. Is the um, walking by the ejector pump room by the drinking fountain underneath? Um, now, this was the hallway of the writer's floor. So you yep. just walk down the white hallway. And then this is the writer's room, which uh, brings back a lot of memories. That's oh. the writer's room, conference room table. Let's see if there's anything else. Um, just a pile of VHS tapes and boxes that just were just piled <laughs> everywhere. All right. My favorite part of that yeah. is uh, the calendar is the most mundane things that you'd see in the building. But then you look at the writer's table and your immediate response is, oh, and you see, you could see and feel the emotion. Yeah, that's uh, the beauty of this. Is just, that. You see this every day, you take it for granted. And then you're like, oh, I spent a lot of time in that room, you know? Yeah. If that right there, that's the gift that keeps on giving, my friend. Yeah. Uh, that's super, super cool. Yeah. All right. What do we got here? <laughs> and so on brand for Steve. That is just. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a file folder that's labeled birthdays. Uh-huh. So there was a tradition at the show when I was a writer's researcher um, where when it was a writer's birthday, sometimes you'd get a call. They used to call, they would call Jill Lederman or me, depending on who was available. And they would say, it's so-and-so's birthday tonight we would like to have a little party after the show, sing happy birthday and have a celebrity guest call in. And so we would have to spend a little chunk of our day trying to get a hold of, but these weren't like your typical celebrities. Uh -huh. It was a little more niche, like old times, old, old school sitcom actors, things like uh -huh. that. And so we would have to try to track them down through their agents or whatever and get them to um, call in. So like these are scripts and then the writers would write scripts for them to read over the phone and call in. So it would be, they would be a mystery caller. So they would say, hello. So they would say, hello, you may be wondering who I am. And they would give three clues. And then the writer was listening and trying to guess who it was. Holy shit. Okay. So is, I have is, one is, is Joanna Jordan involved with this? Is this like Joanna's group? This was or, exclusively, like, no, because Jill was the writer's segment producer. So she was able to access celebrities on her own. So it didn't involve Joanna or the talent department. It was kind of just a writer's thing. And so, like, like this one is uh, um, the mystery caller was uh, Oscar Gamble, the baseball player who called in for Eric Stangle. Then we had um, Nipsey Russell call in and do the poem. People say a mermaid is beautiful. I don't understand why. It's not Are enough. Are you woman kidding me? Too much fish to fry. And so Nipsey Russell did that. Um, we also had Gary Sandy from WKRP call in. <laughs> and uh, Andy, we, Andy, right? Andy What's that? Maybe, it's Andy from WKRP, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I made, I made a list here. Um, we had Jim Zorn, the former quarterback, call in for Tom Ruprecht. Um, we had the baseball player Amos Otis call in for Lee. Uh, for Steve Young, one year we had just another guy from named Steve Young from um, Matonsburg, West Virginia call in. I don't know. There's just a whole bunch of these. Sometimes I'd have to fax Major League, I fax Major League Baseball. Um, this was a uh, Oscar Gamble. Like I was trying to figure out who, how, how to get in touch with all these people. Um, oh, that is just anyway. That's too. a funny little little tidbit. One funny thing that happened during a birthday party I remember is uh, someone turned out all the lights, uh, maybe to bring a cake in or something. Okay. And we were all sitting around the conference room table, and then when the lights came back on, Chris Harris had stood up while the lights were out and draped himself over the table like he'd been murdered. <laughs> So when the lights came back off, everyone's sitting there and Chris is laying dead across the table, which is just <laughs> so funny. It was great. Have you talked to Chris recently? 
Uh, I haven't talked to Chris recently. I remember like I was in LA at some point and he was working on this, uh, this was years ago. We, we yeah. sort of uh, saw him um, when he was working on a sitcom out there, uh, but he was doing the Frasier reboot, which I was I'd just going to say, let's give him some congrats. Some, some Yeah. Some, yeah. So great, such a cool thing. Hopefully yep. that keeps going and going and going. Absolutely. Um, this is a, a file called staff photos. Okay. It's just all of the staff photos that we took over the years. Okay. Oh, um, like the, like the, the big shots of the, I'll, the I'll hold group? them up to you. Yeah, so this is basically like all of these staff photos that everyone oh, took like on the street, uh, in the theater. Uh, yeah, it's just cool to see everybody, uh, how everyone changes throughout the years. Um, the One of the biggest, and I mean, it just shows how, how weird and small my point of view is. One of the greatest honors of my entire life was being in one of those at Rupert's party. Oh, and yeah. I, I just, I can't believe it. And I'm sit, standing beside Steve O'Donnell and I'm like, you know, it's like, where's Waldo? What the hell is that guy doing here? Like, I. Um, but the relationship you develop with Rupert in such a short amount of time, but like the fact that you were, you know, like that, that certainly earned you that spot because, you know, it was such a great way for you to connect with them and them sponsoring your early episodes is so cool. And they still do. And by the way, thank you very much. It's like you've done this before. Uh, the Letterman podcast is one sponsor, one sponsor only. Hello Deli.com. Rupert <laughs> may be gone, but the deals are not. Go to Hello Deli.com, your only source for official Late Show with David Letterman merchandise. And, uh, and, and say hi to Rupert while you're at it. He won't add onions to your order anymore. He is done, but uh, he's not done selling Late Show with David Letterman merchandise. And uh, I just spoke with him yesterday. He's doing great. Oh, great. Good. Yeah. So... Good. Uh, just appreciate uh, really Rupert cool. so much. What that's else? That's such we got? a cool connection. That's oh. great. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, all right, let's see what else we have. Um, this is I don't know. This is a folder. This is uh, scripts from. Uh, this is the uh, the act. The scripts from the final week of shows. Oh. I saved. Uh, I saved this, the final week of shows scripts. You're a from good boy, Jeremy Weiner. You're a good boy. That's so. awesome. Cool to have those just to sort of, you know, yep. take a look at. Once again, okay. the, la the last six weeks of Late Show is, uh, for many people, the greatest six weeks of television ever. It was the greatest culmination of a show. It was uh, really something ever. special. It was such a fascinating thing to be a part of, I'll tell you. So, you know, that was one of my, it's like I, growing up watching the show, just seeing how it sort of developed and knowing I couldn't have been there at that at the beginning. So I just, you know, it was such an important thing for me to sort of see it to the end and be a part of that. It was so great. The uh, uh, we we talked about a little bit about the last show, uh, the the last time you were on. Uh, one of the questions that I that I didn't ask you that I'm going to ask now, um, the top the final top ten list. Yeah. Any any of those yours? I don't think so. No. I think that might have been. I I don't. I, number one, I don't think I wrote that many for it because we were editing. We might have been editing. You know the weird thing we got asked to do a couple of passes to trim down a couple of the old remotes just to yep. make them fit for time. Yep. So I might not have written that many, but I'm yep. not going to use that as an excuse because no, 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 I think just... there was probably, yeah, I would say, I don't think I had any on there. The, um, um, that top 10 list was a really special one. Um, and I forget her name and I, 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 I have it in my head sometimes, but sometimes it just disappears. There's a young gal who had, I think she got two of them on, including the rewrite of, Julia oh, I think you're talking about Caroline, right? She That's, was. That, thank you. Yes, yeah, absolutely. She was interning with us at the time. Yeah, I, I that was that was great. Desperately want to have her on this show oh. and and just even talk about that. Like, yeah, yeah. That was the funny uh, Caroline's line uh, for Julia Louis Dreyfus was the funniest of all of them. I thought, yeah. uh, where she got to take a dig about Seinfeld and then Jerry's reaction. It was so good. It was just that's one of those things where in a show like that where the stakes are that high and you want it to be, you know, it's like. Funniest wins out, whether you've been a writer there for 20 years or whether you, whether you aren't even a writer or have or you've been in the with the writers as an intern for, you know, two months, whatever. Um, you know, at that point, you, you just got to put on the best show you can. And so if it's a better joke then you know, something, go for it. Absolutely. So, and and yeah. I love that she got highlighted for it. And, and there was yeah. a, little of, a little bit of buzz yeah. around her at that point for that joke. Yeah. I just I thought that was really, really special. Yeah, for um, sure. For sure. It's what always neat to sort of see like, like, you know, you see, you, you get welcomed in at, and when you got to take your shot and you got to go for it, you know? Yep. Absolutely. This is near and dear to my heart. This is uh, from Battlefield Earth. This is Turl, John Travolta's <laughs> character. I believe he was the, he was the, he was the chief of security. Um, and it says here in the back, chief of security Turl despises everything human 
and works to imprison each one he sees. <laughs> anyway, love having Battlefield that. Battlefield Earth. Oh, if you've never seen that movie, you should see that movie just to sort of say you've seen that movie. It's bonkers. I could not endorse that statement more. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's a movie where if you guys were still doing the show, uh, similar to some of the other DVDs you showed earlier, there could be scenes that are shown um, yeah. at a certain time, whether we're yeah. there right now or it's another 10 years from now, that's a movie where scenes could be shown uh, yeah. in that version of a comedy show. Yeah. There are some line deliveries in that movie that are just unbelievable. Yeah. They went, for, they swung for the fences. They chewed up the scenery. Yeah. Um, no question. This, um, I got this from Paul Masella, who's a writer at the show, who's now the head writer at, um, Night Show with Jimmy Fallon. Hmm. And it's a it's a little music box that plays the Star Wars theme. Oh, I can't hear it on my end. I don't know if Can it's going to come through in the audio. No. Let me try it again. Come on, music box. Now we can't hear it on our end. All right, but there's That's a little... so great, It plays though. the Star Wars theme. It was like a cool little keepsake he got from when he was in Paris. Oh. Cool That's this cool. This is... This is a little bag of whenever we did, we did like 20 or 30 top 10 lists at military bases mm -hmm. um, early in my career. And whenever you went at the end, whoever was the CO or whoever was the military representative in charge would give you like a souvenir token coin from the unit that you um, that you just hung out with. So like, oh. for example, this is from the 86th airlift wing. Um in uh, at Ramstein in Germany, we did a top oh. ten list at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. Yeah, so I have a few of those military coins, which are super cool keepsakes from those experiences. You know, yeah. <laughs> and then that Ramstein was also a point where we it was a jumping off point when we went to Bosnia with Biff. So yep. we were at Ramstein a couple of times, and we had a great relationship with the military at that point. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you right. know, it's funny talking to Dreesen. Dreesen talks about one of his greatest memories in life. Tom Dreesen was was when he got a chance to go with you guys at one point. Uh, he, yeah. he toured with Dave uh, for for some bases over there, and um, yeah. yeah, he says there's no experience like that. And and everybody who I've yeah. talked to who has been part of that, they they're 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 you'll never forget them. Yeah, that's agreed. It was just it was so great to highlight you know the the, the folks that are just out there serving their country and 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 protecting us, and it was just really. To, awesome to see how much fun it was for them to sort of take a break from their day and just come read stupid jokes for you know half an hour or whatever so that was really special you know it's uh, funny the the show itself throughout <laughs> its entire history has always had a certain earnestness in certain areas and people who serve yeah. um and and don't get me wrong you can make fun of people who serve absolutely but as long as there's an earnest respect that's there um and and that seems to be the sensibility of the show is that there's always um such a respect for folks who serve yeah yeah no it was really great and it was really fun to do i was happy i was honored to be able to go to all these places it would just be me showing up with cue cards in a rental car at all these military bases you know so but it was really fun oh that's fantastic um all right so let's do let's see what's in here <laughs> okay we've talked about this i think before this one is a it's an envelope that's addressed from the national aeronautics and space administration here it is all right, and what's in here? A patch from. So I think it was, I think it was uh, Commander Ashby was who we dealt with, but this is like the official patch with all the astronauts' names. <laughs> and then let's see what's in here. Okay, so then I have a letter here. It says, "Okay, Jeff Ashby, uh, for, uh, January second, two thousand three. Jeremy, we had a great time doing the top ten for the Late Show." I thought you might like to have the pencils back after we flew them in space. All the best for 2003. So they were in space and I think he threw a pencil at the lens or something. So I don't know what kind of spores I just released in here, but uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. Oh my God. Hopefully you get a symbiote costume by the end of business today. Um, yeah. Right. You know, it's funny. Okay. People have asked about the pencils a lot. And there, so there's, uh, there's the two. You had the unsharpened ones, then there's the double eraser ones. Yeah. Um, people always have, have always asked. So there is there's actual late show functional pencils. That's what went up into space. I was curious if it was a double eraser or not. Yeah, um, it, it would make sense to definitely send a double eraser into space because the last yeah. thing you'd want is an astronaut to throw it and then it punctures the side of the space station. That would be uh that would be something. But unsharpened does the same trick. So exactly. uh, that's what went up there. That is incredible that you yeah. you've got something yeah. that's been to space and back. Uh, we're getting down to the end. We're not, there's not too much more. Let's see. Okay. 
All right, this is some just random stuff. Let's see. This is a Christmas card we gave out one year. It says it's been a special year, and it's Dave um, married to Jennifer Lopez. This was the this was I don't remember what year that was. The Christmas <laughs> card. This is another one. The Late Show wishes you one of the following, <laughs> and then this was the inside. It says, um, "Happy Buchanan, wait, happy holidays, wait. Merry Christmas, peace on earth, Pat Buchanan, seasons greetings." Must have been around the hanging Chad years. Who would have wrote that? Is that is that young? That seems we we would do passes of Christmas cards. So this so that's feels a, oh like, that's a, okay. So that's an actual. This was a thing we would do. I, I should probably I, I probably have them somewhere, but we would do ideas for Christmas cards, oh. and sometimes they'd have to be simpler than others. Uh, I'm not sure who wrote this one. Could very well be Steve. I'm not sure. This is we did a remote with Biff Henderson on a cruise. This is his official cruise ship photo. Did he take the whole cruise? What's that? Would he have taken oh, the whole cruise? We did two days. I think we got off. In, we might have left New York and got out in Miami. <laughs> Speaking of which, I was with, I did a remote with Biff. I don't remember when this was, but Biff and I flew to Miami and we were going to do a thing on the show where all night long during the show, Biff's going to be with a metal detector on Miami Beach yeah. looking for whatever. Yeah. Simple, clean, yep. fun idea. Great. After rehearsal, we get word that Dave has come down with shingles. And Bruce Willis is going to be guest hosting the show that night. Mm -hmm. So Biff and I, with no suitcases, no clothes, no nothing, are going to spend the night in Miami because we missed our window to catch a flight back. So we go to the Gap and we bought some new clothes. And we went to dinner and, uh, oddly enough, sat right next to Mel Brooks at an outdoor restaurant in Miami and then flew back the next day. It's just an odd <laughs> fun. So then, then this photo here is a doctor photo of Paul and Biff from Miami Vice. I don't know why I have oh, that. Oh, that's fantastic. Because it's awesome. Yeah, that's it's great. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, this is a birthday greeting for my birthday. They had Lou Ferrigno call in. So this is the script that Lou Ferrigno read. Um, I have a photo here. I don't know why, but I have a little bag that has a cutout of uh, Jerry Foley's face, like little stickers. Someone made stickers of Jerry Foley's face. I don't know why. Shout this is a photo of uh, Keebler Elves with Randy Quaid as the head elf. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, wow. There's some fun stuff in here. Okay. This is... <laughs> This is a little map I drew of all of the places we visited for Biff Henderson's America. I made oh, my own. Map. That's fantastic. So I traveled with Biff on, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I went on nine of them. I think we did 13. I did nine. Wow. <laughs> we traveled all over the country. It was great. Uh, okay, now talking about space. Yes, sir. There was a joke in that top 10 list with the astronauts. Um where one of the re astronauts referenced the astronaut food. And, you know, normally you think of astronaut ice cream, but yeah. he said uh, the joke was powdered lamb shank. Right. And I don't, which was, which is fine. Yeah. So when, as writers, you get to order dinner every night because um, you have to work late. So yeah. they, they have to get you dinner. So we would have these order forms that look like this and they have three restaurants on them that you pick where you want to order from. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I got a memo one day. It says, Jeremy, there must be an ex. Oh, so you're allowed to order one meal and it can't exceed $24. Okay. So that's your allotment. It's like, so with tax and tip, it's 30 bucks. Yep. So I got a memo. It says, Jeremy, there must be an explanation for this. Uh, and it's from um, Pat O'Keefe, who was the head of the finance department. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you didn't order two meals for yourself. Let me know, please. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> and then you look at the order here. And I had ordered a turkey burger and chips and salsa. Yep. Right. And then someone hand wrote in powdered lamb shank with fries <laughs> after the top 10 aired. <laughs> and then Pat realizes it in the same memo. And she goes, powdered lamb shank. This must be a joke. <laughs> so I saved this whole exchange. So I'm pretty sure it was Eric Stangel who did that. And basically uh, just wrote that I ordered an extra side of powdered lamb shank. Powdered lamb shank is hilarious. Like yeah. that is absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Being a real thing. Yeah, that's Steve Young's. You know, I was talking to Steve um, the last time we were we, we were talking about things. Uh, he's got a he's got a parody song that he is building, and it's 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 um oh it's 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 feelings. I forget I forget what the I forget what the the the, the premise was, but we got into this discussion about 
when you're writing something, if you're writing actual things heard on the subway, there's like this unspoken rule. It has to be actual things you heard on the subway. It can't be embellished. It can't be something that you just make up. It can't be, you know, and this, and, 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 and it really was a cool discussion talking about kind of the culture of, of, yeah. of writers. Powdered lamb shank is one of those things. It's just, it's, it's a real thing that when put into different contexts is hilarious, yeah. 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 Uh, but it's a, but it's based on a real thing. And, and right. uh, yeah, yeah, that's one of those things. Right yeah, it's there. interesting. I mean, I think a lot of times for us, it works best when things are as organic as possible. Just trying to to, to make it feel grounded and not going too much, not trying to do too much with something. You know, try to avoid that. Let they say the hat on the hat or whatever. Yes, exactly. Oh, in addition to traveling with Biff for the the um, uh, Biff Henderson's America segments, we spent a lot of time with CBS Mailbag traveling with Biff and the map. And we go to different locations. We went to a riverboat in St. Louis. We went to Vegas outside of, you know, the Bellagio or whatever. Yep. This is a photo of Biff and I uh, in New York Harbor. We did it at the Statue of Liberty one night. So we spent the whole day. It got horrible sunburns hanging out. So it was <laughs> nice, nice to have little keepsakes. Every once in a while, the, the like it was either a, like John Philo or a staff photographer was there yep. with us. Love John. Yeah. He's been on the show and, uh, you know, he was at Rupert's gig as well. Shout out to John. Uh, let's see. This is this is what I was telling you about. This was the American movie. This is Mark <laughs> and Mike. They're the ones who covered the convention for us. Yep. They signed so that's and a signed promo sheet. Um, and then I had Biff autograph his old headshot for me as a keepsake. That's Biff's one of his early headshots. Oh my God. That's also so the cover of his easy listening album. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. The smooth stylings of Biff Henderson right there. Yeah. This is a photo of um Jill Lederman and I from our early days. Oh. I don't know why I have this, but it's um, National Geographic Sexiest Manatee Alive. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, <laughs> I have script covers for when my daughters were born. They put them on the script cover, which is oh, great. I love. And that. then I don't know why I have this. It's a photo of Abraham Lincoln with his stovepipe hat. I don't, I don't know why I have that. Uh, that's it. Okay, so let's see what else. <laughs> Little surprises around every corner. Absolutely. Is this trippy for you? Like seeing some of these things? Is it this is trippy. It's a little weird. It's like it all floods back and you have like instant sort of, uh, it sort of zaps you back. Yeah. This is a deck of playing cards from the Federal Bureau of Miscellaneous Information. What would that have been built? Was that just built for you guys as a, as a keepsake from the book? I think is so. I don't, like... I don't really know why else it would be there. I don't know. I, I can't see that being something that would be, I mean, maybe it's something that they would use on yeah, the show, I, don't I know. guess, but... It also feels yeah. like something that maybe y'all might have just done as a bond. Yeah, I don't remember um, the details around it. Wow. And then this is just a few other folders. Let's see. Let's see what this is. Oh, what's this? Oh, wow. Hmm. I don't remember what year this was. Oh, it's a, there's a timestamp. Uh, November 5th, 2012. Yeah. So this is right around the election. Yep. We were doing, we were coming up with extras in the morning, trying to figure out, you know, whatever the, it was, it was an election cycle. So we were probably drilling the election so hard. And there's, you know, we yep. hit every reference. So I came in one morning with the map of the United States. And I was trying to figure out a take for uh, the electoral scenario. You know how they always show the red states, blue states. This is what it's going to look like. Yep. So the joke I had in that we actually ended up producing, I think it aired, is that there was an improbable scenario where the electoral map, if it everything went the right way, it could spell the word ass. <laughs> so if those red states all were for the Republican, it would be red. It would, it would, yeah. <laughs> and it was just one of those things like I spent like may, I must have gotten in an hour early and took a map <laughs> and just tried to draw it for about a half an hour. And that's what we ended up with. And I think it ended up airing. So that was really good. <laughs> Brought your own pencil crayons and everything. That is That's fantastic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. You know what uh, I loved about that, Jeremy? I loved about that when you saw it and you're like, hey, what is this? And you opened it up and I saw this little kind of smile on your face and- that's every once like, in a while, you I, again, it's all mush. And then every <laughs> once in a while you remember, oh, that was something we definitely did. <clears throat> this is probably my favorite thing that I have. <clears throat> oh. This is, 
I told you we used to order from restaurants, right? So this is a menu from the restaurant Burger Heaven. <laughs> okay. That had been steadily defaced and graffitied by the writers over the course of like two or three years <laughs> with like different show related minutia. Um, <laughs> like, for example, okay, so one of the items in the salad in the salads is grilled vegetables served on a large toss salad, right? Okay. Someone wrote an arrow to it and wrote, way too dirty, you should know my now. And they underlined tossed salad. <laughs> like, it's just... Um, there's so many, like, inside jokes on here. I got to... And that might have not been the most uh, family-friendly one to share. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, this we're one good, says, um, so on the back, under juices and milk, it says apple, cranberry, or V8 juice. Someone circled V8 and wrote, more topical reference, please. <laughs> basically it was like notes we would get on our assignments and they would just put it on the menus so great so um, um if you wouldn't mind if this is another thing there's a few things that that i think as going through this uh a couple of digital photos and being sent yeah, sure. that one there like i'm going to send that to steve and that is steve has gone through a similar kind of box with me in his apartment um and 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 that's the kind of stuff he has a few of those things that again steadily defaced by the writers writers over time yeah. that kind of a thing that is a perfect example that i think many of your brethren would really appreciate seeing again yeah yeah for sure like that is that's there's one more here too it says breakfast is served from 7 a.m to 11 a.m and uh -huh. underneath it just says does someone did someone tell foley question mark because we would always get in trouble for not telling jerry foley the shooting schedule so, <laughs> um i saved a couple of memos that we were given as writers uh-huh this one says, writers, Dave has asked that you refer to the mayor as Mayor Bloomberger in anything new you write. I just thought that's funny, like when <laughs> when the tide turns. Let's see. Let's see. What is this one? <laughs> and when you say that, you can hear Dave saying it and Paul, you know, yeah. Paul responding back. You can you can you can hear that right there. And yeah. There's the architecture of the show, folks. This is the original research packet I submitted. I mentioned Ricky Schroeder. Yep. This is the original packet I submitted. It's like 10 pages. It has all. So if you ever want to know about Ricky Schroeder, you let me know. <laughs> um, I think he goes by Rick now. The rest of this is just, <laughs> I have my summer intern packet from 1998. Uh, the late show contact sheet. If you ever want to know someone's phone number from 2007, let me know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, some of them are still active, actually. I saved a script that I wrote that I'm not going to share the contents, but it okay. just has a circle on it. And then Dave wrote, maybe no, question <laughs> mark. Um, <laughs> and I think that's it for that. And then what's in here? Okay, this is, this is kind of the last of what's in the box. Okay. This is a few top 10 lists that I saved, I think maybe from when I was an intern, of the to the topic, the select sheet, and then the individual passes that people wrote. So uh -huh. This is kind of a cool keepsake. So I have one for all-time classic movies playing in Times Square, hmm. questions on the Zorro application, <laughs> and Saddam Hussein's summer fun tips. And... Um, yeah, I got so that one. How many entries are 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 in that one? I'm let me take a look here. The Saddam Hussein one? Appro yeah, just approximately. I just uh, just to give folks a So on the on the select sheet there's 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8. There's about 25 that were called from the what people submitted that day. So there's okay. jokes from Steve Young, The Stangles, Jeff Boggs, Oh, so uh, it says them all. It says the the author as well. David Jabberbaum, Jerry Mulligan, yep. Carter and Craig, wow. and then the second pass of jokes that people did. So I just saved some of those just as sort of like a reminder. Yeah, but sometimes you would write like I've told you before. Yep. You'd write a couple hundred jokes. Yep. And then you'd end up with uh, you know the cold list. Maybe you get you're lucky if you get one or two. Yeah. You know, sometimes if there's a if it's a slow day or people are busy doing other things, you get more than you get four or five. You know, it depends. But that's really everything that I have. That is, uh, like, I have been endlessly entertained by this here and the stories that have come out um, from 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 this. Thank you so much for participating yeah. in this little exercise here, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, when you do this, it stirs stuff up. It 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 does. 
<clears throat> what are some of the, if we're going to kind of move this over to a close, uh, first off, I don't know if uh, in between when you and I set this up uh, and, and, and decided to, to do this, if there's anything that you were wanted to talk about, Oh yeah. Okay. I didn't talk about this the first time. There's something I want to get to here. Is there anything there that uh, we haven't covered? I was trying to, th I think I mentioned everything. I had written down a couple of things. Yeah. One, late, one, one late show, story. Late that show I was... the movie. I want to talk about late show the movie. That was one of the, yes, things, but what that was after you talking to me about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but okay. Uh, so late show the movie. Um, were you, what was late show the movie? Let's just go into that. So for... th this was Tom Ruprecht's idea yep. and it was fantastic because basically you're given a gift every day of so ce celebrities are co literally coming to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're going to be walking the building. And if you can come up with the right thing. So Tom had this idea. We're going to do late show the movie. Dave doesn't have to be in every clip. It can have all sorts of different celebrities playing different roles. The president, this, that, and the other. And we spend a lot of time shooting with a bunch of different people. Sometimes Biff would be involved. Sometimes Paul. It would end up being this whole big thing. And for whatever reason, maybe it almost got too big. I don't know. And there was too much pressure on it because the, the celebrities were too good. And it was like... I don't know what, for whatever reason, we just kept shooting and shooting more. And it just it was one of those things that fell by the wayside. And it's just one of the, you just, it's so frustrating because the scripts are so hilarious. Tommy's down there and he's got this, you know, grand vision for it. And it just, for whatever reason, sometimes things that you loved just didn't see the light of day and they yeah. just go on to sort of become bigger in legend. And for me, that's what this was. It was always fun to see. It was like, what's this pre-tape? I didn't know. Oh, it's late show the movie. And it was just this huge thing. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It was one of those. It, it was always tricky, too, for me, like as a writer who came on later, uh, yeah. sometimes you'd run into things that you didn't know the show had already done. Like, for example, there was one Christmas I wrote something. It was um, I pitched something called Guess the Gift Wrapped Celebrity. <laughs> and it was like, oh, that could be fun. We're going to we'll wrap Danny DeVito and wrapping paper. Dave guesses sure. who it is. Simple, yeah. clean, fun. And then so I think it got to somebody who's just like, we did that years ago at the old show. It was called a Celebrity in a Sack. <laughs> and it was just like celebrity. And I'm like, number one, they'd already done it. Number two, it's a cleaner, simpler, funnier premise. You know what I mean? And so you're sort of sitting there kicking yourself, going, oh wow. Like, you know, you just run into those moments. Or like, for example, when I was learning how to produce segments, we talked a little yep. bit about this the last time. Yep. Chris Harris wrote this really funny mailbag letter. It was like, Do you and ever do you and George Clark ever hang out? <laughs> and Dave's like, Yeah, we, we went fishing together the other night or whatever. And he does, it was supposed to be him like listening to this pre-tape of George and Dave fishing. But then you quickly realize that it's not Dave and um, it's a Dave double. And so it's, we got Dave's double to be in the boat because Dave didn't want to hang out with George. So he sent this double. So the <laughs> twist was going to be that George didn't want to hang out with Dave and George was going to send his double. Yep. I had to spend three days trying to track down someone in New York City who looked like our building engineer, George Clark. <laughs> which isn't the easiest thing to do, but with about five hours to spare that day, lightning struck and I found an actor who looked identical to George Clark. I'm like, I'm going to, this is like going to be feathering my cap. I've, I'm going to prove myself. I've produced, uh, I've, pr I've produced the talent that they need to make this joke work. Chris is going to be so happy. He's going to love it. The guy gets there 20 minutes or maybe half an hour before they're supposed to pre tape this after the show. Yep. He has the thickest Russian accent you've ever heard in your life and could not <laughs> deliver the line right. So he looked perfect, just like George Clark. But and so I don't think it ever aired because we were trying to overdub him and it just didn't, you know. So that's that's an example of like, you know, you try so hard sometimes and it just, you know, it doesn't work. And that's like the Late Show movie. It's like you, you, you're you grinding this out and it's great. And there's no, you know, and then little things happen that just sort of throw it off, you know, so. Except now, looking back, hindsight being 2020, what a perfect uh, example for an extra for YouTube or for something else where, where, where you could throw something like that out there, give it some time yeah. if you wanted to, that would yeah. be a, um, yeah. that, that is so cool. So is there a chance on any of those CDs, there might be late show, the movie footage? No, because I think those CDs that I was showing, I think those are um, actually like, um, like word documents with scripts. Just, okay, so okay, so okay. I don't think it's videos, and I certainly don't think it's that kind of thing. I don't know where that lives anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be a deep cut that would be fun to look at. You know, it sure would so, be. And yeah. uh, and there's about a dozen of us or so who would just absolutely adore yeah. seeing that. <laughs> um, the next is... time Tommy's on, I think he could probably take you through the history of it a little more. I could, he would more specifically remember what celebrities are involved. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure it's like the all the top names of the day. You know. 
Um, th- thank you very much. Yeah, and and having him back on when when we talked that night at, at Rupert Singh, we've said, yeah, let's let's have you back on. He's Great. he's game for it for sure. Good. Um, you were gonna say one more one other thing before I did late show the movie. No, I think that was it. I think it was. was, I, it? Okay. I was actually going to segue into that the George Clark thing. That was one of oh, those ones. Where, yeah, perfect. yeah, yeah. Outstanding. Um, you yeah. have been so generous with your time, man, and I I appreciate you so much. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the support that you've given us too from the beginning too. You 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 give us love and and. Uh, hey, your enthusiasm that. for this stuff is is you know it's just one of those things. I'm happy to help because I think it's one of those things that you're clearly passionate about it. And if I didn't feel like you weren't going to be a steward of this sort of stuff you know, it would be a different story, but I think this is such a fun thing. And it's nice to be able to take a trip down memory lane every once in a while. Oh, you're, you're fantastic. And, um, as uh, you know, we've adopted uh, many of the things, uh, the Letterman isms of the world, including friend of the show. You are a friend of the show. We love you so much and, and are so oh, grateful thanks, man. and are going to be here for you, uh, for anything that you want to promote there, where anytime you want to come back on, we want to do sure. some writer mashup shows and all that. We want just, uh, if there's ever anybody you want to come on with and you guys want to just kind of go back and forth, let me know. We'll set that up as well. Sure, and, sure. um, and in the meantime, just keep on keeping on and being you. And, and, and I hope uh, much success for you and the family, the girls. Thanks. Uh, I just Likewise thank to you. I hope the show continues to grow. I hope you continue to find an audience. And I hope that people discover this stuff as sort of we rediscover it. So it's cool. Uh, you're the man. I'll do a quick outro here and then uh, we'll say our goodbye privately. Okay, um, good. You know, I say it every single time. This is why we do the show. This is 100% why we do the show. I don't know if there has been another episode in recent memory anyway that uh, that puts the point on the exclamation point of that uh, ideal. Uh, just this, we want to, Stuart, he used that word, um, you know, we want to uh, pass on the knowledge of this show, of, of, of this uh, amazing, what we call the greatest body of broadcast work in history, that of David Letterman and company. Uh, his name is Jeremy Weiner. Uh, my name is Mike Chisholm. This has been the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night overcoat and underpants.